Good afternoon. I'm Holly Morton from the Josephine County Republican Party. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce the lovely Victoria Marshall. She'll do our invocation. Good afternoon. Prayer is powerful. Please, will you join me in agreement in a prayer of protection and victory for these candidates who are standing for our city and our county. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, For where two or three gather together in my name, there I am with them. Heavenly Father, we are here this afternoon. We come to you in your name, not our name, not our power, not our holiness, not even our goodness, but we come in your name. We come because you told us to, to give thanks and to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain a peaceable life in all god godliness and honesty we pray that our community will be safe and prosperous we pray and trust you to help us father to pray as we ought to pray for our candidates and community and so we trust you and pray the Lord's Prayer, and please feel free to join me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much. And would you join me? The flag is off to your left. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a great program for you. First, we're gonna start with meeting the candidates and there'll be a, a question and answer program and then we'll have a panel discussion. Katie Metter and Rachel Sager, you probably remember them. Katie and Rachel, they fired from the school um, just for speaking their minds. We'll be speaking about their case, the current status. Jessica Pope is here, you've probably seen her in the paper. She'll be talking about the gender neutral bathrooms in the local schools, how we feel about that. And Richard Emmons will be here a little later. He's the editor of the Eagle newspaper. We'll have a little discussion about that. Following that, we'll have an intermission, and then our keynote speaker, Dr. Douglas Frank, will speak at 3.30. We've got things for sale in the lobby. If you can support the Republican Party, we would greatly appreciate it. Make a little donation or, or buy something. Has everybody gotten their ballots? Everybody gotten? If you have not gotten your ballot yet, be sure and contact the clerk. Make sure that you get your ballot and remember to vote. Um, everybody should leave with a trifold. I know Victoria's passing them out, but everybody's going to want to make sure that you have a trifold that uh, out outlines the candidates that the Republican Party is supporting. Um, if you are unhappy with the direction that the city is going, there's a citizen effort to recall the mayor. And there are petitions out outside. Please sign those petitions. And let's see, and after the vote has been taken in this election, make sure you can go to sos.oregon.gov to make sure your vote got in and was counted. That's very important. And now I will introduce you to Matt Morsa, who's going to be our MC for the day. Matt's a, Matt does a financial newspaper, actually, a, what is it, Matt? Newsletter. Newsletter. Terrific guy. He's part of our education program at the Republican Party. Thank you very much, Matt. All right, thank you, Holly. All right, first thing I want to do is I want to have everybody stand up one at a time and introduce themselves and talk a little bit about you and what your goals are for the positions you'll be holding, whether it's school board, library board, uh, RCC board, 
And let's start with Dustin Smith. Yeah, I think we're going to sit just because of the microphone situation. I'm too tall for this microphone anyway. Well, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate you standing up and getting interested in what's going on in our community. Um, and for those of you that are here to support us, I appreciate you. We appreciate your vote. Again, my name is Dustin Smith. And um, I um, got asked by my son what it means to be a school board member. And I tried to, he's in seventh grade. I have a ninth grader and a seventh grader. And I tried to boil it down in simple terms. And I said, well, you're kind of one of the bosses of the school. Um, a lot of people get mad at you for saying things or the decisions you make. Um, they don't pay you. And he said, well, that's lame. <laughs> and uh, it definitely is a thankless position. I do thank all of the um, board members that uh, have served our community in the past. Um, I actually do think that um, there's some positive things that are happening in our schools. The tone is positive. We have a good superintendent. Um, but just to tell you where we're at, we have 11 candidates running for four open positions on the District 7 school board, which I understand is impressive. I think in the past, candidates are almost kind of hand-picked or brought up to the budget <coughs> committee and say, you know, someone taps them on the shoulder and says, I'm going to be stepping away, do you want the position? And they run um, without, a, uh, without a fight. Um, so the question is, why are so many people running for school board? <laughs> right now and um, I think a lot of us know the answer and uh, it's unfortunate but our schools have become a battleground um, for identity politics um, people are pushing things down on our kids that parents are finding out about and they object to um, there's a lot of agendas that are coming into our schools there's words like indoctrination um, and parents like me are seeing this and we're concerned and some are upset some are taking their kids out of school uh, moving on to other places and um, for me personally uh, just a couple years ago there was one of these flashpoints with our school district i didn't appreciate how the school board handled the situation and i kind of woke up and i said I, I guess i need to do something somebody else asked if uh, if we did recall some of these candidates would you step in and i said sure um, so i'm here I'm running for position one, um, but we have a great opportunity. We have four conservative candidates running for four open seats. We, we can vote all of us in, um, and we can take back our schools. And if elected, um, I believe parents know best. I think that uh, I support our teachers. If elected, I will fight to keep our kids, our parents, and our volunteers in school and kick the politics out. Amen. You can clap. You can clap. Thanks, Dustin. Chad Dibdahl, running for position two, District 7. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dustin. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for being here, um, for actually engaging in this process. Uh, there's a lot of people that aren't still paying attention, even though the things that we all know that Dustin just mentioned are very, very true. And um, our schools have been hijacked a little bit and taken, um, taken in directions that I think a lot of us don't like. And so I'm glad you're here to listen and to ask questions, hopefully, and uh, to continue to engage with us uh, in the future, um, Lord willing, when we all make it on the board. So uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Christian and I'm a conservative. Um, this is how I approach everything. So um, I won't apologize for that, but that's where I'm at. Uh, I, I love God first and foremost, and I strive to bring Him glory through my work, service, and uh, recreating in this community. Um, I've been here for 16 years. My family moved here in large part because of the traditional values, conservative values, um, and the morals of this community, uh, and specifically District 7 uh, and the school district. Um, as a father of three school-aged children, I have a son in the high school. Um, we're in this room a lot. My wife and I, she's sitting over there, by the way. Um, uh, we listen to him. He's in the marching band. He plays in the band. And we spend a lot of time in this room and a lot of time out at the football field. Um, I have two daughters that are homeschooled. Um, I know that may be a question mark for some, so I'll just address that right now. They are homeschooled because we were not happy with what happened at the start of COVID. 
and we continue to have significant concerns for what is happening. So my two daughters that are middle school and elementary age are not in the school system right now. My hope is that we can put them back into the school system, but I haven't felt comfortable with that, uh, nor has my wife, so that's where we're at. Feel free to talk to me about that. Um, uh, again, I think the state and the district made decisions that uh, were wrong, and we've seen learning loss because of it, and that's a huge issue for me. Uh, instead of focusing on that first and foremost, I think we've seen a huge amount of um, socio-political uh, things come to the forefront of our schools, and that's been a focus that um, I'm against. I think we need to focus on reading, writing, math, history, um, and, and leave the social issues, the political issues to be addressed at home by the family. Um, it's the parents' job to deal with that stuff, not the schools. I think the school board has an incredible opportunity to partner with parents. I'm running as a parent. Um, I'm not an administrator. Some of the folks up here have way more experience with administration than I do relative to schools. Uh, I'm running as a parent to be a voice for parents, and I'm running to protect our kids. I believe I'm uniquely in position to provide insight into this process, this partnering with parents, um, because of what I am and who I am and what I stand for. Um, I'm a Christian. I'm active in my local church. I'm a husband and a father. I'm a physical therapist. I run a local business. I've served on uh, a board and in various other elder leadership positions and elder positions in the past. My mom was a teacher. I've been around schools for a long time. I'm a coach. I spend a lot of time with kids uh, and parents, and many of those parents are teachers in Grants Pass, and I serve regularly. Um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We've been doing nothing for far too long and it's time to do more. Thank you, please vote for me. Uh, it's position two for District 7. Thank you, Chad. Running for position six, District 7, is Nathan Siebel. Sable. Sable, <laughs> oh, like the expensive coat. All right, that's all right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nathan Sable. And I'm really happy to see everybody here. Looks like there is quite a bit of elbow room. It'd be nice to see the room filled, but you all have friends, you all have family. Uh, so you get the word out about the importance of these elections. So I currently, for my work, I manage Oregon State Parks in Southern Oregon. If there's a favorite park you have in Southern Oregon, I'm probably responsible for it. If it's a park you don't like, it's probably a city park and not a state park. So just want to make that clear. I come from a family of educators. My father taught school for 40 years in California. Don't hold it against me. I was raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, that gave me interesting perspective into a lot of things. I have a brother that teaches. I have a brother-in-law that teaches. I have a couple of sisters that teach. Uh, I have a master's degree with an emphasis on teaching, on education. Um, <clears throat> we have great schools here, and we have great educators, you know, these people are our neighbors and they're our friends and our family members. And we want to keep our schools awesome and keep them great. I, I did write down some things so I can stay on message, just so you understand kind of where I sit on things and how I think. I have heard some uh, pushback about advertising ourselves as conservatives in the community. Well, this is what I mean, and I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure this might resonate with others up here. As a conservative for our schools, I want transparency and neutrality. Our government institutions should be trustworthy and honest. Tax-funded institutions should be neutral politically and non-activist. Kids deserve quality mentoring and learning that allows growth and curiosity, not dogmatism. Parents should be able to trust sending their children off into the hands of other adults, and transparency will ma maintain that trust. As a conservative, I want our schools to function well. We, you pay for them, we pay for them. Programs that are not working should be examined. Innovative ideas should be pursued. Our kids' futures and the future of the country truly depend on it, and I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's true. Our educators should get the support and resources they need to fully utilize their expertise. It should be an excellent work environment for them, all of them, even if their opinions are against certain other ideas or opinions or things that are being taught in schools. Schools should, folks should not foster 
division or cause children to hyper focus on differences. Diverse communities are successful when people of all backgrounds are united in their common humanity. American children should be prepared to be awesome American citizens. Is that the end? Oh, <laughs> okay, getting the hand signals. I would like to see our schools leaning more into teaching things like civics, the rule of law, personal responsibility, community service, and the importance of being tolerant of those who disagree. Marketable skills in financial education. As a conservative, I believe in options and empowerment. I have a master's degree, and I'm glad I went to school, but that's not for everybody. In fact, only 46% of our graduates go on to higher education. We need to provide more opportunities for the kids that are not interested in college. Personal also, personal finance and education is an essential. Do our kids understand the difference between good debt and bad debt? Can they articulate the differences between needs and wants? Do they understand the power of compounding interest or how to negotiate purchasing a home or how to start a business? These are just a few examples of how I approach solve, uh, problem solving from a conservative point of view and uh, appreciate you guys all being here. Thank you, Nathan Sable. <coughs> Running for position seven in District 7, Joe Schmidt. First, I'd like to thank the Republican Party for all the support they've given us, and I'd also like to thank my wife for letting me come a little bit out of retirement. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, I'm going to begin with a self-serving promotional statement and then expand upon it a little bit. A vote for Joe, Joe Schmidt is a vote for 40 years of education, leadership, and experience promoting outstanding education that develops lifetime skills and preparation of our future citizens and leaders, support for parental and family rights, the exclusion of identity politics from the school setting, equal opportunity in education should be available for all students, and they should never be held responsible or victimized for the actions of others, nor should they be told that they are victims and have little chance for success because of their particular identity. So expanding on that bit, um, I have 40 years experience as an educator. I was a headmaster, a principal, an athletic director, a teacher, and a coach in three different states. I'm currently a consultant for schools around the country, and I also worked on about 12 different boards, so I understand board work, and I've served on more than 20 accreditation teams for both public and private schools. Uh, so my experience certainly puts me in a unique position to assist the schools and the board in uh, moving forward. When I talk about outstanding education in a school, outstanding education should be based with literacy. With literacy as the foundation. If you can read and write, you can teach yourself anything. If you can read and write well, you can teach yourself anything well. The second thing is, you should also be teaching critical thinking skills. That should be what everything is based on in terms of what students learn. That's hypothesis, followed by evaluation, followed by testing, followed again by evaluation, and then coming to an outcome. Uh, in schools today, whether it's critical thinking skills or whether it's trying to uh, uh, promote different uh, sexual identities, have nothing to do with critical thinking. That's just teaching people how to think, or excuse me, teaching people what to think, teaching young people what to think instead of how to think. In terms of family and parental rights, parents know best. Parents are more committed and know their children more than anybody else in the school community. Parents are responsible and should be held responsible and should be allowed to be responsible for the spiritual, moral, and psycho and sexual growth of their children. That is not the school's responsibility. The school's responsibility is to educate them so that they can become outstanding citizens and leaders in a community. Parents should always be well informed on curricular matters and um, program matters or clubs and events and activities and there should be a great deal of transparency so parents know what's happening with their children. Finally, identity politics, which relates to CRT and the other things. Um, equal opportunity should be allowed for all, but not necessarily equity. Equity is impossible. That's a word that's overused and should never be used. Equal opportunity is what we should be offering for our children, uh, regardless of their identity. Children are not responsible for past failures. Group identity should not prom be promoted as a reason for failure. That just creates more victims. Let's let children be children, let's let parents be parents, and let's let the schools do what the schools are responsible for, and that's educating children so they can be great citizens and great leaders in our country. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.
I want to introduce three outstanding people who are running for our Josephine County Community Library board positions. And we're going to start out with Paul Shasma running in position three. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your the beautiful spring day to come down and see all of us. It's truly an honor. But it's really an honor to stand up here and ask you to be your public rep servant, to serve you guys in the library board, and it's the best in the best capacity I can. I've always been the one who don't always do the best. Started college classes 15, finished bachelor's in three years. But it's always a striving for the best. I am tired of the in people that around in our community and our society succumbing to mediocrity. It's time that we have the best. We should be the best. We should be the finest in all that we do. So I consider the library today, and I'm as an avid book lover myself and from a family of book lovers, I look at the content there and I see it's not the finest. What makes the quality books? What makes the quality? What is a library? A library is a place, well, look at the definition. Latin for libre. It's the plural meaning of books, many books. A library is a place of books. It's not a place of social services. It's not a place of homeless shelters. It's a place of books, <laughs> and it's a place of many books. Those who fail to focus on the priority of valued books in that library lose the right to manage it. Mm. What else can I say? Mm. Therefore, I'm here to bring that, to bring the quality back. And I think books are value, are, have value not because they are a text or they have many words. Yes, you can read many words, but because they give you the truth. They give you the truth of history, and from that truth we can apply wisdom. And with that wisdom, our community becomes better. So, I'm here to bring the library a place in many books for the future a place where the next generations, future generations, can be there. And I am a part of that next generation. It's time to get involved. It's time to stand up. And the truth will set us free. Thanks, Paul. And this is what we really need more of. We need more young people to step up like Paul is doing here. It's, it's not always convenient, but it's very necessary for us to talk to our kids and grandkids and get them involved. For position four, we have Heidi Napier. Heidi. Hello, I'm um, a California escapee and I'm a, a retired veterinarian. I have no political experience at all. This is all new to me. I have been on one board before, that was for a church. Um, I'm running for library board because I, I have a series of complaints about this library, which I will, I will list for you. One of them is, um, the, the, well, the, origi the original reason I decided to run for library board was because of objectionable books I found in the children's section, books that were sexually explicit and books that um, promoted juvenile transgendering and um, several interestingly enough several of the books that promote the juvenile transgender business um, are written for adults and here's one uh, the gender creative child beyond pronouns gender identity guide and so on um, these are written for adults but they were in the children's section now i checked these out and when I checked them out, I was the first person in a year, the only person in a year who had ever checked them out. I took them to a library board meeting two months ago and I complained about them. And Thursday, two days ago, I went to the library and those books were gone. They were not in the children's section. So, who knows? <laughs> so I've spent quite a bit of time on the library's website and they do promote some books there under various subjects. One of the subjects is race and society. They have a book there um, saying that George Floyd 
they have quotes from each of these books that they promote. George Floyd was murdered by a white Minneapolis police officer. They don't mention that he was overdosed on drugs. They have the one book that promotes the Black Panthers. They have one book there uh, pr that they promote that says, the title is, Therapy Isn't Just for White People. It's about a black woman, it's by a black woman talking about her racial, the racial trauma she suffered in this country and how she had to have psychotherapy for it. So what about having some other books that promote the other point of view? For example, Thomas Sowell's book, Black Red Rednecks and White Liberals. Candace Owens' book, Blackout, How Black Americans Can Make, America Can Make Its Second Escape from the Democrat Plantation. Those aren't listed, and they kind of balance things out. Um, one of the things that the, the library is doing is um, planning on building a new library. They have raised, the, the uh, Library Foundation has raised $2 million to buy, um, am I out of time? Okay, okay, if to, to buy a piece of property in downtown Grants Pass between 6th and 7th and H and J, and they're planning on building a 37,000 square foot library with um, uh, a, um, an outside, what do you call it, plaza, which will, be not, which will cost $900,000. And they have a lot of money. I, I have copies of their financial statement if anybody wishes to see it. So um, anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. And, and I want to say something about Heidi, too. She serves on the Republican Party's Education Committee with me, Victoria, Indra, and a few other people, I'm sure, in the room here. She is, without a doubt, one of the best researchers. She's sort of the nuts and bolts. She likes to get into the details, and that library needs that. They need someone to ferret out this stuff in the library and say, is this reasonable for, you know, for youth in our uh, community? So thank you, Heidi. I've decided, and I hope Mike doesn't get mad at me, I've decided, he, he's running for position five for the library board. I'm calling him our firebrand candidate for library board. So anybody who's met Mike knows that uh, he's not light on substance and he's not light on energy, and we all appreciate him. So, Mike Pelfrey. And he's never seen a microphone that he didn't like either. <laughs> But, but the, so if, if you look at me, I do not look anything like what you would think that would be on a library board. So that was not on my uh, to-do list. But I will tell you that uh, I moved here in 2016. I love this town. I love this place. But I don't like the direction that our city has, has gone into. We've gone into a, a really uh, spiral. You can't go anywhere in town where you don't see a tent or a homeless person or uh, a graffiti and even even though that has nothing to do with the library board the problem is is it all trickles down to all of our services i don't care whether it's these gentlemen that are running for the school board or these folks to my left that are running for other school board positions or the library board if we don't step up to the plate if you don't have good conservative voices that are willing to get and what i call put skin in the game it's, you can complain about things all day long, but until you actually step up to the plate and actually uh, make your voice heard, it just falls on deaf ears. So I'm not that person. Um, I will hound our city um, uh, leaders. I send them emails on a regular basis. I point out things. I hold them accountable. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the library down in Medford, you will see that that is the kind of crap excuse my French, but that's the kind of crap that they want to have happen in Grants Pass. The library is not a place for, uh, it's not a warming shelter, it's not a place for the homeless to sleep in the aisles. We have people around that are, that are literally in our city that we have no idea where they came from. Some of them got off a bus, some of them uh, have no identification, and you're going to tell me that you would feel safe with your children going to, to the library to do what they were supposed to be doing in the way a library was supposed to be run uh, as an educational center, but instead it, it turned into a social hub. 
The Medford Library literally just had to go into a contract with private security. Mm -hmm. Who in the world would think that you would need private security for a library? But that's where we're at in this day and age. And so uh, you need, we need somebody that's a strong voice that's going to stand up to the other board members because I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the majority of the board members, if not all of them, are uh, liberal leaning individuals. Guess what they hired to run our libraries throughout the county? The majority of the employees are also liberal. So it, we need someone like me and these other two individuals to go in there and bring balance to, to these positions because we, as conservative-minded thinkers, we know what, what is best for our community. We know that whatever's happening right now is not the right direction. And so we need to step up, stand up, and speak up. And I will do that. So if you'll vote for me, you will never regret that vote. And I'm pretty sure that my fellow teammates on this red table here are going to do the same darn thing. They're going to put their conservative minds to work. And we're going to fix this. Uh, we're going to fix it. Thank you very much. So for our library board, look what we have. We've got youth, we've got nuts and bolts, and we've got fire. That's a good combination. <laughs> So our next candidate, she also serves on the Education Committee for the Republican Party, and she's also a good friend of mine. Um, it's Indra Nicholas, and she's running for Zone 2 for the Rogue Community College Board. Indra. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm very honored to be here today to speak with you about my candidacy for the Rogue Community College Board of Education. Um, I believe that in the power of education to transform lives and to empower individuals to achieve their dreams. I moved to Josephine County 27 years ago, a little over, to raise my children in the small, um, beautiful, friendly community that supports hard work, family values, and education. And now I can say that used to support those things, and we're here to get that back. Um, I have a lengthy career in education at all levels. I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction. I've actually taught a couple classes out at RCC. Uh, I was a science teacher and just involved in all levels there. I also have 18 years of experience in small business in the Rogue Valley. I've served in various positions within my church and I volunteered for numerous organizations throughout uh, Grants Pass and all of the Rogue Valley. I believe the young adults in our community deserve a high quality educational experience that will prepare them to become valued citizens and successful in their chosen profession. As an RCC board member, I will work diligently to help students see a clear path by providing a well-structured, intentionally designed and delivered program that leads to family sustaining wages. I would strive to increase access to associate degrees, apprenticeships, and certificate programs. I would work to ensure that more credits for classes taken at RCC are transferable to four-year colleges. Enrollment at RCC is on the decline significantly. Students are not reaching their goals, yet tuition rates continue to rise. I would work to increase student enrollment and focus on student motivation to increase the number of students reaching their goals. RCC must help students plan and make sure programs enable very busy students to get out with a degree in a relatively short amount of time and at a low cost. One of my key priorities as a member of the board will be to ensure that the college is using its resources effectively and efficiently. As someone who values fiscal responsibility uh, and accountability, I will work to ensure that the money uh, that taxpayers are sending to these schools is being used wisely and that we're not wasting resources. I also believe in the importance of traditional values in education, personal responsibility, respect for authority, and academic rigor are key components of a well-rounded education that prepares students for success in life. One of the things that sets me apart as a candidate is my commitment to promoting academic excellence. 
As a member of the board, I will work to support initiatives that enhance the quality of teaching, expand access to educational resources, and foster a culture of academic excellence and achievement. I believe that a strong education system is essential for the prosperity and success of our community, and I'm committed to working together with stakeholders to ensure that RCC is meeting the needs of students and the broader community. As your most conservative board member, I will help lead RCC to excellence by prioritizing academic achievement, encouraging critical thinking, offering creative solutions, and preparing all students for success. In the world our children will inherit, their ability to adapt, think critically, and work effectively with others will be essential for their own success and the well-being of society. I very much appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Indra. The next two candidates are running for Three Rivers School Board which is near and dear to my heart because both my kids graduated there, um, graduated from there. My daughter was valedictorian in class of 2018 and my son was student body president and won a state basketball championship there. And I very much love the county schools, even though when I moved here almost 30 years ago, they told me that my kids should never go to a county school. So anyway, the, the next person I'm gonna introduce here is Nancy Reese. She's running for zone four. I know we all love our kids, and generally, none of these people would be up here if they didn't love other people's kids, too. I don't think I found anybody who loves all the kids as much as Nancy does. She's really doing this out of the goodness of her heart, and I know I appreciate it. So, Nancy. Thank you, Matt, and thank all of you for being here this afternoon. I've uh, been a resident of Grants Pass for 38 years now, raising three children here that are grown. I now have six grandchildren. And um, I did homeschool my children in their formative years, and then they went to Three Rivers School District high schools. And uh, this, the system is broken, and uh, it's just gone downhill so fast. We just need to fix it. And uh, we need to get critical race theory out of our schools, and we need to get critical thinking back into our schools. Um, we need to get the... Um, I haven't done this before, but um, anyhow, I think I can do a good job in helping get, to get things turned around and to encourage uh, the children and the parents to bring their children back to the schools. Parents need to be fully aware of what's going on in the schools and what their children are learning. And um, I found this uh, last night looking at the Oregon Department of Education. And this is what it says. One of the paragraphs here I think is important. Um, this is from ODE. It is our responsibility to move beyond mere tolerance and inclusion toward respectful affirming and celebratory school communities where all students belong and succeed. Gender expansive students who are absent due to fear or who spend their school day feeling unsafe are prevented from accessing their right to an education. In participation with each of our school districts, we can make 2023 a year of wraparound support for LGBTQ2 SIA plus youth in Oregon. That's what, that's what our government is offering us, and we need to push back and say no. And I also got, thank you, I got a, I received a text this morning. Um, she, a uh, concerned mother, says her son won't go to the bathroom at Hidden Valley High School because of the vaping issue. Um, and she spoke with her friend, whose 16-year-old son is thankful, is at Grants Pass High School and is thankful to have his driver's license so he can drive home to school to use the bathroom. Mm. Uh, this is a bigger issue than I thought. This might be something to bring up to the public. And uh, to let you know that this school has uh, tampons in the boys' bathrooms. Uh, it's disgusting and we need to turn things around and on my way to growers market this morning to campaign um, This came to me. I feel the Lord put this on my heart. We need not redesign our flag We need not reassign our children's gender. We need not We need not redefine America. 
We are a great nation under God. United we stand. Thank you. You can tell she cares. Our last candidate, certainly not least, running for Zone 2 for Three Rivers. A lot of people probably already know Pat. Pat Kelly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, a, a bit about me. I'm not part of the educational industrial complex. <laughs> so I, 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 I just noticed over the last... I don't know, since I went to high school, I graduated in 72, I've seen a consistent decline in standards and ability of children. If this were a good complex, we would see increases and not just decreases. They spend most of their time blaming parents for their own faults, and it needs a fresh look. So my background is I've been an attorney for 44 years, and very weirdly for a conservative, I've represented governments time and time again. I'm, I'm currently, I've been the city attorney for Cave Junction, one of my glorious titles. I have a coffee mug to prove it, by the way. Uh, for, I think, 35 years. Uh, I represent the Irrigation District. I'm a hearings officer for the city of Grants Pass. So uh, uh, my background is I, I, I can research laws, I understand laws, I apply laws, and I apply them fairly and respectfully to everybody, and I make a decision, and I'm not ashamed of my decision, and I make it clearly, and I can't be pushed. Hmm. Because is, at this point, if you're an attorney for 44 years, you don't care what people think of you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I have a certain set of skills, and also I'm a great lover of history, too. And, uh, and how I got involved in this, the trick, everybody has a triggering event on how they got involved. And so I would ask the, the very nice people who serve me coffee at the stands in the morning, and by the way, these are smart people because they can remember 300 customers and their orders, and they are exceptionally polite, and they can even make change, you know? So these are, these are good people. Uh, and I would ask them, uh, okay, who fought, who were the sides of the American Civil War? I get a, a, about a 50% an answer, and they have no idea. 50% have no idea. Then I ask them, uh, another time I'll ask them, well, who had the slaves in the Civil War, if they know the two sides? And I know there's a more sophisticated answer, but the high school answer is, the South had the slaves. They, 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 they can't answer that question. They have no idea. Yeah, and they said, well, it, 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 I discovered, at least I believe at the point, it is the current purpose of our educational system to hollow us out, not fill us up. And to hollow us out and put new identities in, new thoughts in, and reject that which has been traditional, and that's what, what has been associated with America for, for, for the last 250 years. And then I got mad, because every time I go to one of these speeches, or these, these hearings, I get mad for two hours afterwards. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I said, enough is enough. Uh, so I intend to utilize my skills, because the enemy is, is um, the state of Oregon is a problem. It's a significant uh, stumbling block to achieving objectives of traditional education here in Grants Pass. They divide new and more interesting laws each time around to strip us of authority. Uh, and, and the next thing, I was talking to Lillian, she says they, want to, they essentially want a medical clinic in every school uh, to deliver medical advice uh, without parental intervention. Uh, they want, uh, 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 the, the <laughs> They've limited our ability to deal with executives that we hire. We, we can't, um, they've made it very difficult, and I don't know our current district supervisor or administrator, but they've made it much more difficult to remove people that, uh, that offend community values. So they're systematically depriving you of authority and how we deal with this, well, we, we have to interpret the laws in our favor as much as possible, but we also have to protest to our, to our state, and, and we have to resist as best we can, or we're losing it. And, and one thing the kids learn about is ecology, but the, 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 the left is very good at ecology. They've, they've turned 
uh, our school system into an ecology to produce no voters for themselves in the future. That's right. They've turned it into a machine. They've turned libraries into machines to turn out new voters for their position in the future. They use your money against you. They use your civility against you. And, and, and pretty soon you don't recognize your children. And then, then at some point, uh, you're gonna pull your children, if you still care about them, and put them in private schools. And the public schools will systematically diminish. And in the long run, I know that Edgewater is creating its own school. I know that the Catholics have their own school. I know that there's New Hope Christian School. But these schools are filling up rather quickly. So how, if we abandon our schools just by walking out and putting our children in private schools, um, who's left? You know, and, and why are we paying for it? Well, it, it, it's, we, we, we should be able to, as good Christians or good Jews or good Muslims, to send our kids to school and not get strangers back. Uh, they should be teaching what needs to be taught. Uh, American history, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, they, they need uh, reading, writing, mathematics, uh, being civil, uh, and, uh, try to instill a desire to become employed. The current system is designed to create dependencies. Uh, dependencies on other people for your thinking is a very dangerous thing for democracy. And uh, it's time to, to fight. It's time for me to fight personally. So I'm willing to invest my time in this. And, and I, I, I've been told I, I, the greatest threat here is me being bored to death at meetings. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm willing to overcome that great challenge and, and attempt to, to, you know, to pull, pull, pull us all together. I mean, there's so many things we have in common. Why do they constantly emphasize what sets us apart? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's it, it, by the way, schools are not in the affirmation business. Parents are in the affirmation business. I, I got, it, 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 that's, this, it, if you affirm, you know, the, the, the values that will eventually destroy families, I don't think that's a really good uh, a course of action for the country. And also parents should have access to every single textbook uh, and should have the ability to opt out without fear or intimidation. So that, that's, I've been told I gotta quit. So, <laughs> so, so now I'm gonna be mad for three more hours and I blame all of you. <laughs> I, I mean, this is like the 29 Yankees. I mean, this is murderer's row right here, and I mean that in the most positive sense. We have some fantastic candidates here, people that everybody could get behind. And I really don't care what part of the uh, you know, political spectrum you fall on. If you love your kids and you want them to have a good life, these people need to be in those positions of influence. So I realize maybe a couple of you or many of you would have questions for our candidates. We're gonna be taking a break not too far from now. They'll be in the lobby for 15 to 20 minutes. Catch any one of them, ask them a question. But I wanted to take a, a bit of privilege here because I have a couple of questions. And, and it, it touches a little bit on what a few of the candidates said and especially what Pat was talking about. My first question is, for the school board members, if you win these spots, you're gonna be asked to put your right hand up in the air and say that you will follow the laws of the United States Constitution. But as Pat points out, it seems like very few, and I hate to say it, but maybe none of the students graduating from public high school know anything. That they, they have no idea. They, they don't know who any of the founding fathers are. They don't know how this country was founded. I'm just one man's opinion. I personally believe that if our kids do not begin to have history ingrained in them, at a young age and over many years that we will lose our liberty because they will drift from us. And Pat, I, what a great comment. You get back strangers. You drop them off at school and strangers come home to, after they graduate. So my first question has to do with that. 
How big a role do you think history, and you, you're gonna have to make it short, and that's my fault. You could address it later with some of the people here. How big a role or how many years do you think U.S. history and American history should be taught in school? And we'll just start here to my right with Dustin. Well, thanks. Well, first of all, yeah, uh, you know, swearing uh, to uphold the Constitution is important, um, and teaching the Constitution is important. Um, and there's a lot of variability, um, even with my own kids, and depending on the teachers they have and what school they're at, exactly how much they retain. Um, and so it's very important that they are subject to, at least in high school, you know, um, U.S. history. Um, and I think that they um, need to be able to read books that um, inspire them to want to learn more about uh, history. I'm actually a fan of uh, the Bill O'Reilly series, um, the Killing series. You know, there's uh, Killing Kennedy, Killing Lincoln, Killing Jesus. Um, it really brings history alive. And so my view would be to make history exciting for kids. Um, it's super important, and that's all I'll say. All right. Thanks, Dustin, Chad. And if we could, 30 seconds or so. I'll, I'll be short. Yes, the Constitution should be taught. Constitutional history should be a part of the education system. I don't have a number for you as far as how many years, but it absolutely should be taught. Um, that's one of the reasons why my daughters are at home, and they're currently working through that. All right. Thank you, Chad. Nathan? If you want to make our children cynical and kind of dumb, then you just give them a very narrow view of what the United States is about and what it is. You can focus on things like slavery, which is true, but you also have to teach the whole picture. The United States did not invent slavery, it inherited it. And it's something that was, for example, uh, practiced on every continent and every people over the last 5,000 years. America was born when the Constitution was ratified in 1787. Writing with our history teacher? Okay, 1787. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson outlawed the Atlantic slave trade. 68 years over that, we fought an incredible civil war where 600,000 people died to kill slavery. So if you want to talk about things like that in history, you talk about the whole picture, and rather than being ashamed of or hating your country, you appreciate the amazing role that the United States has played on the human stage, on the historical stage. And that is the way we have to help our kids understand the society they live in and the country they live in. You don't hyper-focus on things without providing context and helping them understand. It does them a great disservice. So we need to teach history in its fullness. And when you do, then you appreciate what we're involved in here. The American Project is the most amazing thing that has happened on this earth. Powerful points. Wow. Joe. Yeah, I'm a history teacher, actually, so I have a real bias. I'm a U.S. history teacher, as, as a matter of fact, so I have an incredible bias. <clears throat> First of all, in terms of how history and what history should be taught in schools, I believe it should begin at the very beginning. It uh, should be age appropriate. It should be uh, set up in such a way that the child is mature enough to understand the nuances as they get older. Um, at the elementary level, I have fond memories of standing up as a kindergartner and a first grader saying the Pledge of Allegiance. But I also remember my teacher talking about what the Pledge of Allegiance means and breaking that wonderful, wonderful uh, devotion that we would have every morning uh, down into its elementary parts. And it worked great in elementary school. And then every time we, uh, we did something good or we were involved in some kind of project, uh, we were referred to uh, things about or, uh, topics of citizenship and what it means to be a citizen, whether a citizen of the class, a citizen of the school, or a citizen of America. And you can, you can give those lessons to children in their everyday life as they do things. When you move into the middle school, the kids should be um, presented formally with civics courses that provide them with an understanding of what it means to be an American citizen, uh, what an honor it is to be an American citizen, and how, it impo how important it is for them to uh, share their uh, citizenship rights and responsibilities with each other and with the country. Um, 
And during times that are important like this, times of elections, those things should be talked about and discussed at the middle school level. What it means, what a presidential election means, uh, and what a uh, statewide election means, or what a local election means. Middle schoolers are ready for that. In the high school, it becomes much more complex. It certainly is complex in the middle school, but it gets to those really deep, nuanced issues about what it is that's great about America, and what are the things that America didn't do so well. It's important to share that. That's where critical thinking comes in. Share the good, share the bad. And then let the kid think about that, let the child think about that, and come to conclusions. So American history should be taught, certainly in the ninth and 10th grade, at least one year of American citizen. But that's not enough. It should be taught throughout the entire four years of high school in some form or fashion. I also believe there should be a lot of electives. I used to teach modern American history. I taught a, a, a course called Heroes and Villains uh, that dealt with American history. Uh, these kind of electives where kids can really delve into specific topics of history when they're in high school. And again, they should be involved in experiential activities at the school that reflect the history of the country, whether it's mock elections, whether it's debates. Uh, I used to love to put up debates, uh, put debates together in front of the entire student body where students would get up and they would take both sides of an issue or they would take two different candidates and they would debate the candidates and the kids would get to vote on that sort of thing. They should be trained to do that at a very, very young age and be able to uh, experience throughout their uh, high school experience. Matt, Paul, Paul, would you like to address that? I would love to. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you asked about the Constitution and where do you learn about it? Look at the history. Read the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Those books explain the long debates that our founding fathers took before they wrote that document. And, the, and, the, and all agree to, all 13 colonies agree to have it. But where are those books? Are they censored from our libraries? Mm -hmm. Is that history being censored from us? How can we allow this to happen? We need to have these books and this content and our history back. Thank you, Paul. Heidi, would you like to address that? Yes. <laughs> I, have, I have a very simple solution, and that is to go back to the way I was educated in the 60s and the 70s in high school and college, go back to the same textbooks that I used, and I, t I, I was required to take <clears throat> a year of of American history when I went to the University of California. I mean, this was for college students. I had to read the Federalist Papers. So it's easy. Just go back to, you know, go back to whatever it was 50 years ago and do what they did. I'm sure Mike's got a short 30 second statement too. <laughs> yeah, I'll be real brief. Uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's history or any anything of of, uh, of use from an educational standpoint. At the end of the day, when a kid leaves school and they've been in the grasp of their teachers for seven and eight hours, and then I know when I was a kid, uh, the library was very important because it was a quiet place where I could do my homework, but it was also a safe place. And you know. At the end of the day, if you feel safe in your environment, you are going to learn a, a lot more than what you would if you were worried about your surroundings. You don't need to be stepping over homeless people in order to, to find a book in the hallways or in the aisleways of the, of the library. So again, I, 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 I would hope that you'll do a little digging and you'll understand how bad uh, the Medford situation is. We are going to do everything in our power to make sure that our library here in Josephine County is safe for our kids and our families. And then once you get inside the library, you educate yourself until, until you have no more education to get. So just keep on reading, keep on doing what you need to do. But at the end of the day, do it. But let's do it in a safe environment. Thank you. Thank you. Indra. Yes, I would just add that we need to go um, through every course that's being taught and look at what it is. Um, we do we need to get rid of we must get rid of any courses driven by leftist ideology and they hide behind really nice names so you look at the name of the course and you think oh that sounds great but when you find out what's really being taught it's horrible and they're they're 
destroying our children. They're, they're destroying the critical thinking of our children. It used to be, especially in college, you go there to get a well-rounded education. Our, they are failing our children. They are coming out not knowing anything, even out of college. Um, we have gender studies, we have race and ethnicity, we have, I mean, all these courses that don't even help them to be successful and get a good job. They're there to learn to get good jobs. And we can't compete. Our students are coming out of college and they can't compete for jobs in the workplace. Ask any business in town. So we need to do much better in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Nancy. I wanted to say that it's bad that we, as a nation, were slave owners, but I don't know of any other country that has ever owned slaved slaves and no longer does. I'm proud of my country, I love this country, and I'm afraid that a country that uh, doesn't learn from its history is doomed to repeat it. Thank you, and Pat. I like all the other answers, but I just can't stick with ditto. So at the end, I get to do the big picture. Um, the truth is, the brutal truth is, 200 years ago, I'll bet that every one of your ancestors were peasants. European peasants tied to the land. The truth was that their vocabulary was between somewhere and 300 and 500 words. They never left without permission more than five miles from home. Um, the United States is a little different than most countries on Earth because on our own, um, we escape that system. And I, I am not going to, and it seems to me, and I'm gonna be absolutely brutal here, that forces in America are attempting to make us serfs again. Mm -hmm. to, you, you have no value except to, uh, I remember the line in Ben-Hur, we keep you alive to serve this ship, roll mm -hmm. well and live. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have no value mm -hmm. uh, as individuals. <clears throat> Uh, when people finally threw off the yoke of serfdom, came here, um, uh, they came because you were valued as an individual. You weren't owned by the state. You are not subjects. People who live in England are subjects. They own you in England. Mm -hmm. Here, you're a citizen. You're free. You have value as an individual. You get to rise and fall on your own, on your own initiative. And, and I'll be damned if they're going to take that away from my children and my grandchildren mm -hmm. and go back to that lovely form of serfdom where they could tell us to eat crickets, uh, drive defective automobiles, and never go more than five miles from home while they live a life of luxury. Yep. This is what they have planned for us. Mm -hmm. This is the schools are part of the fight. It's a bigger fight. And, and if you want to keep your freedom, it's time to open up your mouths, uh, open up your wallets to support candidates, and, and, and for God's sakes, get votes and get your neighbors to vote, because as it stands now, your children are headed for a very nice form of serfdom. Mm -hmm. And I think that, the, that, that our founding fathers and everybody who's fought in a war in America to preserve our freedom will hate you for that. Do you want to live with that? I don't. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. I'm sure everybody does. So, I would like to really thank these candidates for running because they certainly have other things they could be doing, but they're in the fight, and I appreciate it. So, as, as everybody here exits, are we going stage left here? Okay, so we're going to exit stage left, and then we're going to have Katie and Rachel are going to come up and talk for a few minutes, and then we'll have Jessica Pope and Richard Emmons, but you can all come up now and grab a seat up here as they're leaving. And go ahead and take your water bottles with you too. Appreciate it. So I know you're gonna have many more questions for these candidates. After the next panel, there will be uh, time in the lobby to meet and greet with any of the people that you hear speaking in the first part of the segment. So keep, hang on to those questions and make sure you, you ask those in the lobby on intermission. Thank you. Many of you, if not all of you, uh, 
know what's going on with Katie and Rachel. And they've come in here today just to give us an update on their case and kind of tell us what's going on. So I'm not going to take any time. Go ahead, ladies. Thank you for being here. So I'm Katie Medar, and this is Rachel Sager. And uh, we are here speaking as private citizens and not representative of any educational entity. You will understand that disclaimer in a moment. So we, uh, we're actually gonna assume a little bit that you don't know all of our story and give some backstory, but we're Oregon educators and we started a grass movement, um, a grassroots movement called I Resolve to speak out on gender identity education policy and offer solutions that would allow teachers to continue teaching without violating their conscience and respect the rights of parents. After posting a video online to promote our ideas, we were placed on administrative leave um, because school administrators received pushback from people who disagreed with our ideas. While we were on leave, the school board amended policy further, restricting free speech in the district and forcing teachers to provide a disclaimer when talking about something controversial off campus and not during their working hours. Hence, today is Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Public schools can't force teachers, we can't force teachers out for having opinions on important topics, especially those that relate to education itself. And likewise, they can't further restrict speech just by labeling it controversial. We were terminated for speaking out. We were reinstated, but to inferior positions. Katie uh, now works for the Grants Pass School District in the online alternative program with limited student contact, an inferior position to the one that she had had in the building. I was reinstated to the online school as well in Grants Pass School District, then moved to a public charter school, which did not have sufficient funding to keep my position. And I'm now searching, I have been searching for work, but I've not heard back on any applications I've submitted. I still have on record in the school district, or the school district's termination in my file that follows me to whatever job I go to. Public schools can't retaliate against staff for sharing their personal beliefs and ideas. Educators are just like everybody else. They have ideas and opinions that they should be free to express. Advocating for solutions they believe in should not cost them their jobs. Teachers should be free to advocate for the good of their students. We proposed reasonable solutions that would protect students and respect teachers' ability to speak consistent with their beliefs by refraining from using pronouns that are inconsistent with sex. Children who struggle with gender dysphoria should be given the best care we can provide. And this can only be accomplished when policies reflect reality, not when they are based on harmful ideologies. <laughs> Students deserve the best care we can provide, and teachers should be free to share opinions on what's best. We were concerned about policies that harmed students, parents, and teachers, so we posted a video expressing our concerns while offering solutions. We created and posted the iResolve video off campus and on our own time during spring break. And not long after, we were suspended from our positions in the local school district, forced to file a lawsuit, and eventually terminated. No one should be terminated for expressing concerns. Educators must be free to advocate for solutions that protect students, parents, and teachers alike. We can all agree that no one should be punished or retaliated against for expressing their opinions. Otherwise, this whole panel would have been in trouble earlier today. <laughs> Matthew Hoffman, which is an Alliance Defending Freedom attorney who is coming on as co-counsel to represent us, explains it this way. Public schools can't retaliate against their staff for having and expressing opinions on fundamental issues of public concern, like gender identity education policy, that implicate the freedoms of educators, parents, and students. Thus, we are appealing the magistrate's, the magistrate judge's rule ruling, and we're appealing it to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, asking them to remand it back to the district courts for trial. We ask for all of your prayers. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I just have to add something. I just have to add something really quick. I know earlier, I can't remember which candidate said that it's time to step, oh, I think it was, well, it's probably Mike. Uh, but he said, you know, you gotta step up, stand up, speak up, but sometimes you gotta pay up. So I actually signed up, because I know Pacific Justice has been working <coughs> pro bono for you. And so I let him deduct a certain amount of money for me every month to help fund uh, cases just like this, and they're they're opening new offices across the country. They're a great organization to support, and I'm glad to hear that you have another legal firm backing you up. So that's fantastic to hear. All right, so our next guest is Jessica Pope. Uh, she lives in Cave Junction, Illinois Valley area, and she has some concerns about the new bathroom structures. So let's 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 hear it, Jessica. <laughs> um. Good afternoon. Thank you for letting me speak with all of you today. Um, I am here on behalf of not only my, myself, but many other parents, community members, and staff at both the high school and the middle school in Illinois Valley. I'll start with saying all things done in darkness will eventually come to light. I say that because parents were not adequately informed about the changes being made. It took a staff member who wishes to remain anonymous to protect their position, um, to bring said changes to the attention of parents. It's a disheartening to say the least that both teachers and staff feel they cannot come forward and voice their concerns in fear of losing their jobs. Um, I will just start off with the main concerns parents have. Um, the first one being sexual assaults. When you put boys and girls together, you're playing a risky game. That is not an overreaching concern because it's already happened. In 10 minutes, it took, or it took 10 minutes to pull up 40 plus cases of sexual assaults in gender neutral slash co-ed bathrooms, however you want to use the terminology. The second one being the safety issue. And this is gonna be half and half. The safety issues, include medicals, heart attacks, seizures, allergic reactions, ODs, um, and that's where the design flaw comes in. Three days ago at Illinois Valley, there was a medical emergency. The only reason this man was found was because he was able to be seen from the bottom of the stalls. Um, sorry. If we have this design of floor to ceiling, what are the chances of finding somebody if they're in trouble? There are noise sensors, but in some emergencies, maybe a lot of noise won't be heard. And if it's after school, there will be no one in the office to hear the alarms. Putting students and anyone at risk of not being found and losing vulnerable, valuable time for life-saving treatment. Um, I talked to my daughter about this. She is in 10th grade. Um, if you have never been a 15 year old girl, you cannot imagine how embarrassing it would be to be in a bathroom with maybe a boy you have a crush on or anything else. Especially during girls' times of the month, it's already hard enough time. They should not have to share that space and that private time with the opposite sex. Um, something else I want to bring up is my husband and I had many um, <coughs> meetings with Mr. Valenzuela, Mr. Wright, and Mr. Pratt. Mr. Wright is the principal at IV. Mr. Pratt is the principal at Lorna Byrne. We asked simple questions, um, one being um, if the cameras were to fail, because there will be cameras facing the sinks and the mirrors. They could not... Um, give us an, an answer. It was, you know, simple questions. Well, if they fail, we have uh, a lot of bugs to still work out. Let me make this very clear. There is no margin for error when it comes to the safety of kids, period. <laughs> and um, another thing I wanted to say here real quick, um, Davey has said over and over and over again that this benefits everyone. And just because he says it, doesn't make it so. Mm -hmm. 
before I introduce Richard, a lot of you already know him. He's fantastic, publisher of the Eagle, great paper. I just, I just want to add something. Um, I had a chance to talk to Jessica earlier before we started this, and we expressed the same concerns. The problem is, parents have no idea what's going on in these schools. They have not a clue. So nothing has changed since 1979 when I was in high school at a 3,000 kid high school. We never told our parents anything. And I wasn't a bad kid. But there's stuff going on at school like this. You, you know, I, do, I believe the superintendent, Valenzuela, said, oh, well, we've been talking about this for a year and a half. The problem is, what did he do? Did he send something home with the parents, did, did, with the kids, to get the, the parents notified that this was going to be happening? The parents don't know. So if you, if you have kids and you're not paying attention, you got to start paying attention. If you are paying attention and you have friends who aren't paying attention, do the right thing. Talk to them, tell them what's going on. Because how much farther do we let this go? I mean, Mike pointed this out. How much farther, Pat pointed out, how much farther do we let this keep going? So with that, Richard M is gonna talk about the homeless problem here in this county. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm always looking for a good story because as Matt said, parents have no idea what's going on. So I'm gonna give my card to Jessica so she can sit writing a 600 word article for the next Eagle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You don't ask, you don't tell. But it is a story that needs to be told because, like I said, I can totally go along with Matt. I mean, I dropped out of trigonometry to maintain a high GPA, and I replaced that class with ceramics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I made coffee cups, you know, but it kept my GPA up, you know, from my. But uh, I also want to uh, just speak to Katie and Rachel at the, in their December. 2021 issue. I mean, 600 words is like our typical article length. I wrote over 3,000 words to try to correct the record. And I'm not saying that to, to pat myself on the back, but I am saying it because the, their story is still being mistold mm -hmm. out in more conventional mainstream media here in Josephine County. <laughs> and, <clears throat> so just, I'm going to take this moment just to correct the record because it, it was reported that they start a social media campaign to promote their video on why bathroom should, you know, boys for boys room, girls for girls room. And it went out on social media because of the ministers, administrators at seventh district seven school district. So I just want to correct that, take that opportunity because it was it's not fair to them, and it's still going on. Uh, you may have been following the, the, the grants passed city council. Mm -hmm. So unlike the federal government, they have to have a balanced budget. So does Oregon. And one of the topics that came up at a recent city council meeting was whether or not to close the Hillcrest fire station. Now when it comes to public schools, it's like, well, we've got to cut spending. So you, you pick something like, you know, we're going to get rid of the football team. You know, you pick the most, one of the most popular things and you, you propose that as a ploy to get higher taxes or something. But in this case, it was very interesting watching the city councilors because at least four of them, by my count, when they had time to comment on these proposed changes, they said, uh, close Hillcrest Fire Station, that's a hard stop. And then the next one would say, that's a hard stop. And, and I, I picked up that little you know, phrase that was new, I'm always trying to grow my vocabulary. You know? It's like, whoa, hard stop. <laughs> That meant they're going to vote no, no matter what else anybody says. And I thought, you know, we need to have more hard stops in, here in local politics and local government and even in what the local citizens expect to have happen. And I want to focus on something you may or may not be aware of, and I really didn't become aware of this until yesterday, Friday. I had an idea for my Eagle News update and sent it out as an email. But I thought, you know, this is really good. I'm not going to send it out as an email. I'm going to tell all of you. And it has to do with the new taxes that Portland has, Multnomah County. And the big point here, I want to get across here, is that if you or if we elect people that want Portland-style services, then we are going to end up, one way or another, paying Portland-style taxes. It happens to be that Portland now has the second highest marginal tax bracket in the United States, second only to New York City in terms of what local tax and 
state income tax do they pay? One small difference, in New York City, you need to earn at least $25 million to hit that top rate. In Oregon, you start at $125,000. Yeah, they're terrible. And I, I wrote these out so that I could, you know, I don't want to make a mistake because it's like kind of crazy. But one of them was approved by the voters in May of 2020, and that's the Metro Supportive Housing Services Tax. And this is to provide services for those that are experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of funny, isn't it? You can imagine, if you stop paying your rent to your landlord, you are at risk of experiencing homelessness. But all of us sitting here, we're at risk too because, you know, lightning might strike our house or something like that. But anyway, this is a tax on personal income, 1% local income tax, over 125,000 individuals, 200,000 for filing jointly, business income tax of 1% on profits over 125,000, and it's for all income earned in Oregon. <laughs> so when you take your Oregon tax return, they're gonna take that total income line, and they're gonna want 1%, it's just 1%. I mean, yeah, come on, 1%. <laughs> I mean, doesn't the one percent? Oh wait, that's a whole other thing. Okay, there's another one. How about the Multnomah County Preschool for All Income Tax? Now I'm speaking from experience. My mom sent me to preschool back in 1965. <laughs> I had a big sister; she was pretty chill. Younger brother, yeah, he, he, he went along with everything. But Richard, man, you know, if he wasn't challenged academically or something, man, he was a handful. So my mom sent me to preschool back then. But it's really unusual for preschool for all because, you know, parents like to raise their kids, ideally, not in all cases, obviously, until they're ready for kindergarten. And some maybe aren't ready for kindergarten, which is why it's optional. But they have a 1.5% to 3% personal income tax mm. to provide preschool for all. Now, there's a couple things bad with that. And I don't know the nitty gritty of how it's working out, but there are a lot of preschools up there that were doing just fine without a personal income tax. And that again starts at 125,000 or 200,000 per couples. So together, you know, that gives Portland the second highest combined income tax. And it's just really, really high. Uh, national CPA firm Perkins and Company, they did a report and they say that a small business owner would have a total state and local tax rate of 26.2%. Okay, now if you take 26.2% of your year, that's basically the end of March. That mm -hmm. you're working for Oregon and Portland, Multnomah County. Okay, I'm glad you're all sitting down. Because Herman Bearsugar was on the Bill Meyer show about a week ago, and he was talking about how when he looked at it, if you added up all the income taxes, that people are paying 60%, man, he, he's got to get his facts together. He, he is so far behind the times. This report by the CPA firm showed that with federal income taxes, the total income tax rate for a small business owner goes to 67.1%. Okay, that doesn't count his property tax and all those annoying little taxes that you see on your cell phone bill and other things. Cool. All I know, maybe when you buy a set of tires for your car, there's an excise tax. I'm not sure. Utility fees. You know, if it's mandatory and you give it to the federal, state, or local government, if they call it a fee, it's still a tax. Okay. That's, I like to keep things simple. So now I want to talk about the consequences for Portland families. Because you can see how they get these things passed. They promise this benefit to a problem. Because people need more preschool, because you've got to work, and you've got maybe husband and wife both working, one for the pay their taxes, and the other one to pay for family expenses. Homelessness, big problem. But when you pass a tax like that, and you only apply it to those making 125000 and more, guess what? Everybody gets to vote for it. So in a long, long time ago, I don't know when, but you only voted for a property tax if you own property. It kind of makes common sense because you're voting for a tax that you're going to pay. But in this case, these taxes went before the voters and they passed it. 
So, what, what does that mean? Well, let me give you a little bit about my background. For a total of nine years, I worked for two different relocation companies. One was a subsidiary of Weyerhaeuser, I became the controller at 28 years old, and that company would help people move from, say, Dallas to Denver. So they would help companies move their employees from one part of the country to another part of the country. And there's also a consulting group that actually worked with CEOs to say, uh, you want to move out of California? Great, we can help you do that, and we can look at all the different states on where to move to. And I remember, you know, a couple of things. It's like there are certain states that just, they didn't even make the list. I mean, they weren't even, not even close to making the list. So what does that mean for people that live in Portland? What it means is that no one that might in years past wanted to move to Portland. It was a beautiful city, a lot of recreation. It's just a nice city to go to. It was a big city, but it didn't really feel like a big city. Well, see, these new taxes take it off the list. Because guess who pays these high tax rates? It's the CEO. It's the, it's the chief financial officer. It's the top people in the company. Maybe the top salesperson easily makes over $125,000. He would have to pay this tax. So they simply don't relocate their company to Portland. And, and it's not just Portland. When you hear Multnomah County, there are lots of cities that are there. And then you also look at what can you do when your lease is about to run out. Do you renegotiate your lease and stay in Portland? Or do you go across the bridge and move your company to Vancouver, mm -hmm. Washington? Mm -hmm. It's a no-brainer. If in Grants Pass, if they had never gone south of the Rogue River, and there was a city of Redwood that was south of the river, and Grants Pass decided to add you know, personal income taxes for the city only, and Redwood didn't have that, guess what? All the companies would move across the river mm -hmm. And that's where they would be because they could save four or five percent on their taxes. I mean, this is just common sense. Unfortunately, it's not common enough because they put these on the ballots. So it's really, it's really unfortunate. But guess what? It could get worse because they have another bill on their May 2023 ballot. See, so I'm here to give you good news because see, on our ballot, when you fill them out, you'll notice there's no sales tax hike, there's no property tax hike. There's nothing that's going to raise your taxes, and that's really good. Not so much in Portland. They now have a proposed Multnomah County capital gains tax. <laughs> yes. Yes, a capital gains tax that would affect you when you sell your home. Mm -hmm. You would have to pay a capital gains tax based on the increase of the value. Mm -hmm. If you're retired and you live in Multnomah County, every time you take money, out of your 401k or IRA, you would pay the tax on those withdrawal payments to pay for your retirement. Now, there is an exception to that, so it's not as bad as it could be, because when they created the PERS law, they specifically exempted it from local income taxes. So the other taxes didn't apply that I've talked, that are already in effect. PERS, they don't pay it. The capital gains tax would affect PERS people if they sold their home. But they could live in Portland and not pay those other two taxes on their PERS income. Um, so how does this affect us here locally? It's, it's really, I, I want to just try to leave with you the idea that there's always time when like, we need to do something. Like there's a problem, we need to do something about it. And just be really careful on how you define we. Because when children have problems, the we is best, it's the mom and dad. That's the we, all right? But when we have a problem in Josephine County, and specifically Grants Pass with homeless population, we have to be very careful when we have elected leaders that say we need to do something about it. We need to help that problem. Because these problems, once started by a government agency, they're really, really hard. And I know I step on a lot of toes. I'm looking at the front row. And I see a couple open-toed shoes, okay? So just, you know, I step on toes all the time. But think of all the people up here. There was a time in which it was a good idea that we need to educate children that are poor. We need to have free education. So, when it, so each and every one of you that graduated at 18 with your free education, you might be 68 years old, you might be 78, you might be 88, but you're still paying for your free education. Think about that. 
Because I was talking to somebody in our church, he's like saying, yeah, he was kind of grumbling, he's 78 years old, and he still pays all his property tax. He said, yeah, it all goes to the schools. And I go, no, nah, about half of it goes to the schools. But, and I told him, but you're just paying for your free education, so get over it. <laughs> he took it well. He took it well. So, so a couple things here. This, this hard stop. So for school board members, you need to do a hard stop on any of these new crazy clubs, any new of these programs. If you can do a hard stop, just vote no. Just say no. I'm going to vote no. Principal, no. I'm going to vote no. I don't care. The sale mandates it. I'll vote no. I'm going to get outvoted, but I'm going to vote no. Hard stop. Uh, hard stop. Hard stop. Not hard stop. That's different. Okay. That, that's when you get your tax bill and you pay 67.1%. As a small business owner in Portland, that's hard stop. Okay, and then, uh, you know, for city councilors, just, just be, you know, we've been around as a city since 1857. We've gotten along fairly well for all those years without any new programs. So maybe we could not have any new programs while we try to figure out how to fund the new programs. And then for the commissioners, you know, get word to them. Would they please, please put the Greater Idaho Project on the November ballot? Give us another chance to just say no. Come on, Noma and Salem. Thank you very much.